Well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for spending our Tuesday night um, with us. We have a great session planned for you tonight, Asthma Medication and Devices with Jenny Gowan. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Catherine Ferreira and I'm part of the primary health care team at the Primary Health Network. And my role is a continuous quality improvement program officer. So basically this session um, aims to update health professionals on the latest asthma medications and devices. And it also is going to include, it's a very hands-on um, practical session. So it's going to include a demonstration of the correct techniques for each of the devices. And Jenny will also highlight the benefits of the correct device use in maintaining asthma control for those with asthma. So before we start, then I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. So the Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network would like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which we're virtually meeting today. We recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters and culture, and would like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, you're all muted. So please keep your microphones on mute, otherwise we can get a bit of feedback. Um, you can ask a question at any time during the um, meeting. So please ask the questions by the question box or raise your hand. Um, the, this, it will be recorded, the presentation, but only the presentation component, not um, any questions due to privacy. So. So before we get into the session, I'd just like to update you on what's happening at the Primary Health Network. So we've got a number of education sessions coming up that you might be interested in. We've got Care Awareness and General Practice on the 11th of November, 6 p.m. We've also got um, Does My Patient Have Blood Cancer, um, which is looking at um, white blood cell counts, blood clots, anticoagulation. That's for general um, practice as well, 18th of November, 6 p.m. Um, we've got a series of long COVID ECHO sessions. Now, ECHO is referring to the model of um, learning. It's a very adult um, approach learning, which looks at um, interactive ways of interacting with the audience, plus having a lot of case studies and um, sharing amongst peers. So with the first one is management in November. Um, and that's a session. We've also got management of mental health issues. Um, and these are great sessions because it's, um, you know, very new evidence that's emerging. So it's all very new information. So that one's on the 3rd of December. And we've also got a long COVID echo session for what's known about the natural history of long COVID on the 17th of December. So put those, anything you're interested in, in your diaries. Um, I'd also like to bring to your attention Health Pathways. We've got, whoops, we've got over 750 pathways for GPs to use at the point of care. If you haven't got Health Pathways, um, I suggest you do get it. It's extremely popular. It, we have, it's continually be, continuously being updated and refined. It's a fantastic resource for, for general practice and um, it's free from us. So if you would like it, please, and you haven't got it already, please contact the Primary Health Network and we can arrange that for you. Also, if you've got any um, particular passions in any um, interest in any area or a particular skill in, area, in, in any area and you'd like to share that or be involved with PHN in our projects um, and you've got a bit of time to spare, which um, might be a bit hard at the moment, but um, please contact us and we'll put you on a list um, to be part of our think tank and we will approach you if we do projects in your area of expertise or interest. And finally, our family violence quality improvement project. Um, this is a new project which is starting up at the PHN. Um, we're looking for um, 30 practices to participate. It's been funded by the Department of Health and also the University of Melbourne. 
um, and it's to assist general practices to address, um, to be able to recognise, address and refer people at risk or experiencing family violence. Um, if you would like to participate, practices are incentivised with $3,000 plus GST. You will also get RSCGP accredited CPD activity opportunities, education and training with sub subject matter experts and connections with local family violence services. So what's involved then, you know, um, really the whole the whole practice team needs to be involved, everyone from your receptionist to your GPs, um, your nurses, your allied health, your practice manager, it's a whole of practice project. You'll get support from MAS and also the local family violence service um, during a five month project. So there's three um, rounds of the project over 15 months, 10 practices during each wave. So if you think you're interested, but you're not ready yet, and you'd like to do it next year, please still put in an expression of interest. Um, you don't have to be, it's not something that has to happen immediately and be involved in one of the later waves. And there's some online um, education and in practice, possibly um, education sessions and some virtual workshops as well. And surveys and reports to track and evaluate the progress of your programme. Skip to slide. Um, so if you'd like to apply for that, um, if you, this is the, um, the link, I'm just putting an expression of interest. So the expression of interest can be found on our website or if you'd like to write that down, expression there. As I said, we're looking for 30 practices and the lead for the project um, is Irina. So she can be contacted through the Primary Health Network. Now we'll get on to today's session. So I'd like um, to present to you our presenter, Dr. Jenny Gowan. Jenny is a practicing pharmacist. She's a teaching associate at Monash University and a clinical associate at RMIT University. She's currently a member of the PSA branch committee, editorial board member of OSDI, guidelines committee for the National Asthma Council, Australian Asthma Handbook and the RACGP Silver Book for Aged Care. So Jenny is an accredited consultant pharmacist and conducts her own company focus, focusing on medication reviews in the home and aged care facilities as well as quality use of medicine consultancy. Jenny works regularly in community pharmacy plus sessions in a GP clinic at a community health centre and Jenny's published over 180, sorry, 380 <laughs> educational yes. articles and presents hundreds of talks annually. Quite amazing, um, Jenny. In 2010, Jenny received the Sanofi Aventus Award by the University of Sydney, and in 2013, PSA Australian Pharmacist of the Year, and 2016, Jenny with the AACP MIMS Consultant Pharmacist of the Year. So over to you, Jenny. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine, for the introduction, and uh, thank you also to Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network for the invitation to present to you tonight. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to see you in person, but we'll do the best that we can. So away we go. So what we're going to do um, in the next um, hour or just under an hour, and some of you will have been at session one, so it might be a little bit of overlap, but some of you will also be doing session three and four. So tonight we're going to focus on the medications and we're going to focus on which device for which person and how to use them because we need uh, to really pay attention to this. We have already done the acknowledgement to country. So what we're going to do tonight is go through the different classes of medications used in asthma management. We will describe the importance of the correct technique and I will attempt to demonstrate them here from my computer in my study. Normally when we do these sessions, I love them because you have them on the tables and you all have devices that you can take away and you all have a go and that's hands on, but we've got to do the best that we can do now. Are you all hearing me okay, Catherine? Jen, can you hear me? Yes, all good, thank you. Good, we're just doing a check for sound and the slides are all up, everyone's seeing those okay. Is that correct? The slides are all fine? Yeah, great. 
thank you. Fine. So what we do is the, there used to be three classes of um, medication, but they've now gone down. We used to call them relievers, preventers, and controllers. And controllers always remind me of Thomas the Tank Engine coming along and controlling everybody. We got rid of that because we've now gone to simplify it. We just talk about relievers and preventers. When we're talking to patients, that's the language that they understand, unlike our jargon of sabers and labers and lamas and ICSs and so on. So we have to be very careful to use the right terminology. So the relievers are short-acting beta-2 agonists. Preventers can be non-steroidal products that will go through, but predominantly they're the inhaled corticosteroids, which in asthma should um, uh, may be used alone, but the long-acting beta-2 agonists should never, ever, ever be used alone in asthma without a concomitant inhaled corticosteroid. Otherwise, you're just treating the bronchoconstriction without treating the inflammation. Then you've got two, one short-acting and one long-acting of the muscarinic antagonists, and they're really when all else has failed. Then we're moving to the final stage of severe asthma with other medications where we look at the biologicals with it. Now, the chart that I've just put up is an absolute mainstay, and I would encourage all of you to get a copy of this from the National Asthma Council. You can actually get it sent out to you in a very large A3 um, poster that you can have in your surgeries or in your pharmacies, depending where your practice uh, place is, or you can just print it off are the, uh, the National Asthma Council website, but it is the key to understanding asthma, really. So we'll go work through this. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. I know it's small, but um, you've all got good eyesight, I hope, and that it should actually make things simpler for you at the end of the day. So we talk about the SABAs. The SABAs are the short-acting beta agonists, and they give relief within a very few minutes, two to three, four minutes. And you've got your Bricanol Turbuhaler. We used to have a Bricanol meter dose, but that's now gone off the market. We've got Ventolin and Asmol and many other generics that have also come in, which are all salbutamol. And then you've got your Eremia and your Autohaler, which is a little Autohaler like so. Um, those ones are available without a prescription. Now, Australia is the only country in the world where this happens. And this, whilst it is convenient for people, it has led to overuse. And we're going to talk quite a lot more about that. Certainly, all people need to have a short-acting reliever for emergencies, but they shouldn't be relying on a short-acting beta agonist reliever, such as Ventolin or asthma, which are the main ones that are being used. If they're using it more than twice a week, on a regular basis, they need to be on a preventer. So looking at your preventers, you've got your non-steroidal preventers, which we don't use that much, but in some cases they are very useful. There's Monte Lucast, and the brand name is Singulair, but Singulair has actually been taken off the Australian market, so we've now only got Monte Lucast as the generic of it. Um, it is only pharmaceutical benefits for children under age 15. So adults who need it, and there are a few that have got severe asthma that may also need it. It's a leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist, so it antagonizes one of the mediators that cause inflammation. And in some cases, people will be on multiple other medications, but may need to be on the Monte Lucast as well. A uh, word of caution with it, there have been reports of suicidality, um, and there have been lawsuits uh, suits against um, Milk Sharp and Dome um, with Singular um, through a group of mothers who are saying that this caused their children to have suicidality um, uh, uh, trends with it. So we do need to warn people, not that they're going to have, um, have their children experiencing suicide. I generally say to them, if you notice any change in your child's mood, please go back to your GP and check it out to see whether that medication is suitable for you or not. So I just use it as a mood disturbance and I also document it that you have actually told them about it. Certainly it is on the consumer medicines information if you feel that you're able to explain it to them and they're not going to be alarmed. It's a very, very low risk, but people get alarmed about risks with it. Now, the other two, Intel and Tylate, um, we very seldom use these days. And in fact, again, 
a lot of countries have discontinued them and at National Asthma Council we just had a call from the companies to say do we still need them and certainly some of our top end specialists said there's the occasional case where they're very very useful Intel we used to use quite a lot in kiddies but very rarely used now and Tylade in the docromal again occasionally there's the odd case of somebody who has got really quite a severe allergic asthma that they may actually benefit from that. It actually desensitizes the mast cells, um, stopping the um, breakdown of degranulation of the mast cells. Um, the Tylade, you get two inhalers in a pack because it's quite a sticky liquid when it comes out and that gives them a chance to actually clean the other inhaler and dry it properly before they use it. So they're not due as much, but uh, they have got Intel and Tylade have got very minimal side effects. Occasionally I will see somebody being used nidocrimal for a um, intractable ACE inhibitor cough um, in some cases that will help them so it's not used much and I think when I went to look in the pharmacy the other day to see if we still had one we didn't even have one but they are still available and still listed um, by the TGA and on the PBS in Australia. So the mainstay of treatment are the inhaled corticosteroid the preventers and as I said if somebody is using on a regular basis Ventolin if it is not provoked by exercise or does not provoke by a respiratory tract infection but everything being equal and they're using it more than twice a month it used to be twice a week it's now twice a month on a regular basis then we need to think about using a preventer and that's all changed as you would have heard from the first session those that went in there's options and we're going to go through the protocol when we get to the cigarette so you may be using the flexitide um, together and having the Ventolin as necessary or there was now the um, use of the Symbicort in the Turbihaler, the Rapihaler and the Durarest to be used as necessary in mild asthma. So let's just come back to going through the conventional method of the inhaled corticosteroid preventers. So you've got your fluticasone propionate, you've got your flexitide um, in the acuhaler and in the metered dose inhaler. You've also got your generic put out by Cipla. The problem with this, these charts is that they get out of date and be aware that they're always going to be out of date because there's new products coming in. And the product that is missing there is one called Annuity, which is put out by GSK, which is fluticasone furiate which is a different salt than the propionate. It is six times more potent. And unlike the flexitide, um, the fluticasone propionate, which is used twice a day, the new one, annuity, is only used once a day with that one. We'll come back to that further on. Then we've got QVAR, um, QVAR, which is beclomethazone, which is now with the international harmonization of names. It is not a typo. It is spelt now beclometazone which sounds like you're lisping and you've missed out the methazone. So that one has been around for a long time, comes in the QVAR, in the autohaler, and in the metered dose inhaler. You've also got Palmacort, which is butasonide, which is the same ingredient that is in the Symbicort, but you can get it alone just with the inhaled corticosteroid. And then you've got your Alvesco down here, which is a very interesting product. Um, it is a pro-drug and it is converted and metabolized in the lungs to desmethyl cyc um, cyclosanide. It is less irritant and it can be quite useful for some people who actually get um, a cough from an inhaled corticosteroid. So for those people it's useful, but the only concern is that we don't have a combination with it. So in this case, this is where you'd need your cyclosanide. If you did need to have a long-acting beta agonist, you'd use your Cerevent or your Oxus with that particular combination. And on top of that, we've now got a new one that has just come onto the Australian market called Fostar, you might need to write that one down if you've got a piece of paper, F-O-S-T-A-I-R, because I have trouble remembering all these new names that have come off, so, uh, come onto the market. And that is beclometazone in combination with uh, formantarol. So that's going to fit in with the combinations here. So uh, another one here that um, is moving on with the beclometazone as a cuba, but has got its long acting agent with it. Sneaking down the bottom here, 
we've got Asama, which is a short-acting anti-muscarinic agent, which is generally used in emergency department for quick bronchoconstriction, bronco um, dilatation after somebody has got bronchoconstriction in the ED department, or they may put them onto um, a um, intravenous um, or onto a pump with that one. So that one is still available and is approved for asthma. So if you're finding that they're using their preventer, one of the inhaled corticosteroids, alone, and they're still needing to use their Ventolin or their asthma more than twice a month on a regular basis, then we step up. We step up to the combinations of the inhaled corticosteroids, which is your Symbicort, which is your Butazenide, which is your inhaled corticosteroid, and your Fomonterol. Again, that's not a typo. It used to be F from Montreal with E in front of it, but now it's just from Montreal. So that is like a long-acting Ventolin um, from Montreal. It acts as a long-acting beta-2 agonist with it. So we've either got the Symbicort or the um, generic one here, which is Duresp, um, which is a product in its own mind, and we're going to actually talk more about that. Or you've got your Ceratide that has been in for number of years now. I think it's coming up for about 20 years that since Ceratide was introduced with the Purple Dragons um, by GSK. So that is your inhaled corticosteroid together with Salmentorol, which is a long-acting beta agonist. So these people with the Ceratide will need to have a short-acting beta agonist for their um, emergency plan because this one takes uh, depending on which literature you read, can be anything from eight, nine minutes to uh, 12 to 15 minutes before it actually causes a bronchodilatation. So you've got your fluticasone propionate and your salmenterol in the metered dose inhaler, then you've got your acuhaler. How are you going? Are you all looking bewildered because I can't see you? But it does get confusing and it doesn't stop. Let's go on. We've got the duo resp that I've spoken about, which is the same product our formulation and the same indications as the Symbicort, except it's not a metered dose inhaler. It looks like one, but it's a dry powder, and that's a trap that we need to go make sure that people know how to use it. Then you've got your flutiform, which is your fluticasone, your inhaled corticosteroid, together with the formonterol, which has got a faster onset of action. To further confuse you, these two and the low doses can be used in an emergency under people that are on the SMART program. Whereas this one, whereas it could theoretically be used, it hasn't been approved at this stage. And then we go further down and we've got, again, a generic, which is your fluticasone and your salmenterol, which is similar to your serotide. And then GSK brought out a few years ago, Brio Ellipta. Now, Brio Ellipta is a combination of your fluticasone furiate. Remember, I spoke about that before back here. So it is more potent, but the... Um, it is a once a day inhaled corticosteroid together with Valenterol, which is a long acting beta agonist, which has got a long onset of action. So these people on this one would still need to have their short acting beta agonist for the emergency treatment. Okay, so that um, is certainly um, adding to it all the time. Then we come over here and we've got our long acting um, anti muscarinic agents, of which for asthma, there's only Spireva Respimat that is approved for people with top end uh, asthma where they're not getting other control. The other agents are used for COPD, which we're not going to go through in great detail today, but I will just um, pause at it at this stage. And I can't see my slide there, but never mind, we'll, I know what's there. We've got your Spireva Handy Hailer, and you've got your Bataris Genuair, which I will demonstrate how to use, and Seabree as well, and your Incruise Ellipta, and then you've got your Trilogy, where you've got all three in together. You've got your inhaled corticosteroid, you've got your Lava and your Lama, but that is only approved for COPD. So all the ones coming down this side of here are only approved for COPD apart from your Spireva Respimat. And to further finish off uh, COPD, you've got your Lama Lava combinations. That's your long-acting anti-muscarinic agent together with your long-acting beta agonist. So that is like your um, Spireva type product together with a long-acting Ventolin type product. So you've got Spialto, Tyotropium, and your Olodaterol. You've got your Brimacaya, 
which is exalidinium with fermenterol. You've got your Ultibro, which we're going to go through to show how to use it, uh, Dacaterol with your glycoperonium. Then you've got your eumeclidinium and your bilenterol. Try saying those names after you've had a few drinks or you're tired. Now, there's a key with that, that when I say this to GPs, they love me because when they're trying to work out what they've got, the anything ending in I-U-M is a llama. So you've got tyotropium, axolidinium, and eumeclidinium and glycoperonium. Ending in I-U-M is a llama. Now, llamas all end in O-L. You've got your olodaterol, your formanterol, your valenterol, and your indacaterol. And over here, you've got your salmenterol. The only exception to that rule is your salbutamol, which ends in OL, which is not a long-acting beta agonist. Got it? Let's hope so. I'll quiz you on that later if I could, if I could go around the tables and see you. The Ombres sitting down here is a lovely little product, but is only approved for COPD, and that is your long-acting beta agonist on its own. Cerevent and Oxus are also used on their own. So that really is your whole asthma and all on one slide. So let's move along for a bit now and we'll talk about the short-acting beta agonists. They're used on an as-needed basis, which is PRN. They directly relax the bronchial muscle and they last up to four hours. They work within a few minutes and they relieve the symptoms of asthma due to asthma narrowing in most cases. Every so often, if you've got an acute asthma attack, you may find that they're non-responsive and this is one of the problems of overuse of these agents. Overuse of these agents can lead to non-responsive airways and then you have an emergency. And we still have well over 400 deaths per year with asthma. So they're the mainstay for your acute relief of asthma symptoms at this stage. But we are moving towards Symbicort and the various similar products being used for acute relief of asthma symptoms. So those products as we've gone through are your Ventolin, your Asmol, your Aramar and your Bricanol. Used a lot, people will get shaky, they'll get tremors. And we used to get those shakes and palpitations, particularly when we gave kiddies the um, Ventolin syrup. And many of you may recall having patients that they would say, I can't give my child that because it becomes hyperactive. We also get that effect when people are having nebulized salbutamol. And as you know, that is generally not a preferred treatment except in emergencies now. So we'll put, people will put it down to hyperactivity, but it is basically an overstimulation of the adrenergic system by it. Now, to explain to patients, when asthma educators work, they have these lovely tubes that cost quite a bit of money. In the pharmacy, I don't have time for that, so I use my hand. And I explain that when your airway is closed over, we need to actually relax it. And by using the Ventolin, this is actually relaxing the muscle. But it is doing nothing for the inflammation that is on the inside. And that's one of my key tips to try and get people to use something to actually control the um, uh, whole inflammatory aspect of asthma. Years ago, when I started in pharmacy, Asthma was seen as a disease of just aero narrowing of bronchoconstriction. And some of you that are as old as me might remember the Medihaler isos, which were basically adrenaline, isoprenaline. And it, people used to get very really hyped up with that. And we weren't treating it, asthma as an inflammatory disease. So this is where your stay comes in. And you can see it, there is your airway. And you can see the inflammation on the inside. So I draw pictures about this getting, the cells are swelling up and there's getting mucus plugs, which is why they have got the air in their lungs and they can't get their air out of their lungs. If I had you in a room, I'd have you standing up now with your little cocktail straws and make you breathe in and out through a straw until some of you fell on the ground, but not quite. But you could see what it was like trying to breathe in and out with a constricted airway. And it's a very handy sort of thing to think about just breathing in and out through a single cocktail straw. You can always get those at the nice venues with these nice black straws, but no cocktails, unfortunately. Okay, so the preventers are the anti-inflammatory agents. They need, in most cases, to be taken regularly. So these slides will eventually be updated as we go through onto the newer part of the new asthma guidelines that just recently came out. Your preventers, as I've mentioned already, are your oral Montelukast 
and you overseas there are more leukotriene receptor antagonists but only in australia we've only got the monte leucast there's one called zypha leucast put out by astrazeneca but um, monte leucast is the only one we're currently using and the chromones which is your intel um, or your tylate so your inhaled corticosteroids are your butazonide fluticasone propionate and your cyclosanide, as I've mentioned before, your um, beclometasone and your fluticasone furiate. Now, they can cause side effects such as thrush. Uh, generally, with these ones used on a regular basis, we are suggesting that you use a spacer and you rinse your mouth out after. Um, so long-term inhaled corticosteroid use can lead to cataracts, can lead to osteoporosis. So as part of your long-term management plan for asthma, we like to look at the calcium intake of a patient if they're on long-term um, inhaled corticosteroids and also look at their vitamin D and keep a track of their bone mineral density depending on their, um, particularly their family history. So we try and maintain the lowest possible dose to give good asthma control. The long-acting beta agonists uh, produce the long-acting bronchodilatation. And as I've mentioned already, should only be prescribed with an inhaled corticosteroid, which is why the combination product is by much the better way to go. Um, so the larvas on their own, which is your oxus and your cerevent, um, have got, our oxus has got a fast onset of action, but salmenterol on this slide says 15 to 20 minutes. So it depends very much on the individuals. So they cause that prolonged bronchodilatation, but no treatment of the inflammation. So this is where we've come to the combinations, where you've got your fluticasone propionate with your sub-amenterol, your butazonide from Monterol, your beclometasone um, uh, from Monterol, which is your Fostar, and then you've got your Brio and your Flutiform. Now the um, Brio is the once a day, um, the others are generally twice a day for best use, although we have got some people that are using the Symbicort as necessary and or once a day. So that's starting to slightly change the guidelines. So you can get the dysphonia and the thrush. The other ones are the Atrovent that I've already mentioned and the Spireba Respimat, which um, can be used if you're currently on the high dose and have a good go steroid in the larva and it might be prior to going on to a biological. The oral corticosteroid medications are reserved for use of severe flare-ups of asthma. If they're on a short course, which is often only three days now, um, 25 milligrams for three days or 50 milligrams for three days. It used to be milligram per kilogram, but we've seemed to go to just, just the 50 milligrams for three days. Um, sometimes people might need to be on them longer. There's no need for tapering if they're on courses less than two weeks. If you've got a severe asthma sufferer, then you might need to... I hope my husband answers that. There's probably somebody ringing to see that they. Um... Oh, thank you. Ask my husband to be aware of the phone because you, you can't take it off if it gets difficult. Okay, um, so with the oral corticosteroids, if you've got somebody who's got severe asthma, then you may, and they've been on a corticosteroid for some time, I would suggest tapering them because they feel really high and buzzy when they're on the corticosteroid. When they come off, suddenly they will feel all black. But generally for short term courses, courses, we don't need that. If all else fails, then we move on to the severe asthma treatment. And this is referring off to a specialist with it. And they will either um, add on with the omelizumab, mepolizumab, um, benrelizumab and dupilumab, which has just come out recently. Um, but they have to have had other criteria as a respiratory specialist. They have to have either had hospitalization or very severe flare-ups with that. For those of you that are interested, I found a new website last night that I hadn't looked at before, and it's called toolkitseveresthma.org.au. So it's toolkit-severeasthma.org.au. It's absolutely fascinating. I tried to work out who had put it on and uh, put it up, and it's actually uh, the writing group is some of our top respiratory specialists in Australia. So well worth having a look at if you want to know more about severe asthma management as well. So the uh, Dupixazent is the latest one, and that has got um, um, anti-leukotriene um, uh, 4 and anti-leukin 4, and it is used alternate weeks. Cassandra has just come out with a self-injector, so that's pretty handy. 
um, and mipilizumab is also in a injector where omilizumab needs to go and a um, uh, infusion with it. So they're very exciting, but they need this very close protocols, but it's certainly giving big control of those people with severe asthma with it. So this brings us to our latest of the ziggurats, which used to be just a straight little pyramid going up, and it looks very confusing for those that haven't seen it before. There's lots of details about it in the asthma handbook. It's basically now that only few patients should be relying on the Saba alone. And as I've mentioned, using that ventolin inhaler, salbutamol inhaler, more than twice a week on a regular basis, they need to be stepped up. Now they can either be stepped up to the regular daily maintenance and higher corticosteroid of your flutricasone or your butesonide and the Saba as relieved or as needed, or you can go to your butesonide promontorol, which is your Symbicort or your Duoresp as needed which is a really much a good option for those people that are non-compliant with it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this diagram because it's going to be taken up and spoken at length in the other sessions that you've got in this series. So then if you're still not getting control, and this is only for mild asthma. So we've got a danger of people who've got moderate asthma thinking that they can just use their um, inhaled corticosteroid um, as, ne as necessary, but uh, only for mild asthma. These people need to be stepped up and they need to have regular daily inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beacon agonists or the regular maintenance as well and always making sure that they have an action plan. Um, only the low dose of the butazenide for Montreal can be used as needed. The higher doses, they're going to need a separate inhaler with that. Then we step up to the higher doses of it by that stage, you're starting to get to a referral to a respiratory specialist if they're on the medium to high doses, and then you're adding on the specialised treatment of your biologicals. So I could spend the whole hour talking about that, but we're not going to, so because we're focusing on devices. Okay, so let's have a look at our devices. They're absolutely vital and the mainstay of treatment. If they don't, if we don't get the devices right for the person or the animal in these cases, we thought we'd, you'd like these with the cats having the spices and so on. Um, but if you don't get this right, then you're not going to get good control. And a lot of people use their devices incorrectly. A lot of them don't want to know and they close their arms and just um, don't want to listen. So we need to go simply through. It is really good if you can get somebody, somebody to demonstrate in front of you but I don't have much success with this. They get very inhibited and they get very, oh look, I'll do it at home, I'll do it at home. So at least demonstrate it yourself. Um, please, all of you have your own kit of your placebo devices so that you can just pull them out and demonstrate in front of a patient. If you don't want to do that, then you can get onto the videos. There's a lot of them available on either the Asthma Australia website, the National Asthma Council website, or the, um, uh, the Lung Foundation website. So there's lots, of, and the NPS website. So there's plenty available, but they take a good five minutes for the demonstration. And sometimes it's actually quicker to do it yourself, depending on your practice environment. But you need to be sure that you're using it correct yourself. So if, as we say, if you don't do it, you're getting um, reduced deposition of the medication to the lungs, more side effects, um, more risk of hospitalization, EDs, um, increased use of corticosteroids, and you're not going as well. So it's choosing whether it is the conventional metered dose inhaler the, um, or whether it be a breath actuated one, which is the um, slightly different, and we'll talk about that with your um, uh, Spirera Respimat, or whether it be a dry powder device or the soft um, mist inhalers as well. So the breath actuated ones are actually these ones here, which I don't use that much actually. So to simplify it, all of it we need to prepare the device. And some of it you will shake, the metered dose inhalers you shake, but the dry powders you don't. Um, sometimes you'll have to prepare or load the dose and then always breathing out fully and gently, but not into the inhaler. Inhaler in the mouth and seal the lips round the mouthpiece. Breathing in slow, steady and deep with the metered dose inhaler and the um, breath actuated metered dose inhaler, the dry powder, quick and deep. So remove it from the uh, mouth and generally I say hold the breath for up to 10 seconds. Um, in practice, most people then might hold it for five. 
So it is one puff at a time. It is not puff, puff, as I see many people doing at sports events. So the general tips of the dry powder ones, they do not need to be shaken with it. Um, they must be held correctly as per the instructions. Um, and like these ones have to be held vertically. These ones need to be held horizontally, otherwise the powder comes out. If there's a device that's got a capsule, you've got to make sure that it is pierced correctly. So these are some of the things that we've found when we're talking to people where things go wrongly with it. Okay. Okay, so the measured dose, shaken between each dose, held upright and should be used with a spacer and a mask for young children. And I find in emergencies, a mask is, is absolutely, um, a spacer is vital. For people with disabilities, a mask is very useful. By a mask, I mean something like this one. This is a kiddies one here, uh, which works extremely well for some of my patients in aged care with dementia um, because they really have to breathe out of it, whereas they cannot coordinate the other sprays. So with a spacer and a metered dose inhaler, there were two methods of using it. I prefer the tidal breathing, and I find that that works best with it. So here we have a placebo, and I'm, I can't see myself, so I hope I'm in the middle of the screen with it. This one I haven't used for a while, so I'm going to check that it's still going okay, which it is. We put it in nice and securely, and for a normal person, you don't need the face mask. So I'm going to not say, here we are, Johnny, when you get to school, have your puff. Oh, because I've already loaded it in, which I have heard some parents have done. Now we put it in the mouth and we... So we've got one puff and four breaths with that one each time. If you're very smart, you can do the first method, which is, again, shaking it and putting it in and... That is what they call the recommended method. So it's up to you which one you find is going to actually suit your patient. Let's talk about, but a spacer is absolutely vital and we'll deal with spacer care in a moment. The straight metered dose inhaler is very hard for many, many people to use. So we need to remove the cap, check the dose counters. Now the new Ventolin ones have got a dose counter on it for the 200 doses, which is something that's just come in, but I haven't got that one to show you at this stage. Breathe away gently from the inhaler, put the mouthpiece in between your teeth without biting, and and then gently breathe out. And practice it yourself. You can get these devices from the companies, from the GSK, from AstraZeneca, and from the generic companies. So moving on, the autohaler, we very seldom use these days, and I haven't got a placebo one for that one, so I'll just have to show you. You firstly, you move the bottom container here, you put it up, and then when you go to breathe it, you breathe in, and that will actually actuate it, and it will come out in a fine stream there. So that one works for some people, but not for all people. But if they're having problems with the meter dose inhaler and the spacer, it's another option for you. The AccuHaler, we are not using as much now, but the AccuHaler should be looking like so, and we pull it back so that you've got the little mouthpiece showing there. You then pull it back and it is open. You put it horizontally. If you actually loaded it when it was vertical, I did this for some trials for some time and I found I had yellow powder all over my device because if you had it vertical, the powder came out. You breathe in slowly for at least five seconds and hold it and then you close the cover to close it up. We had one lady who, when we asked how to use it, she said, here's my device, I love it. Just looks like a purple powder compact, just beautiful. I pick it up each time, I inhale it like this, and I put it down ever so careful not to touch anything. When we looked at her records in the pharmacy, she was getting a new one every month. She was never loading it up. But she said, you told me it was just like my eye drops, dear. It would only last for a month. So she had poor asthma control because nobody had sought to check whether her technique was right with her device. Okay, so the Ellipta is the new one that's come in. Now, an Ellipta is 
has got a red dial on it when it shows that there's nothing in there. So you can still keep using it, but if they're colorblind, they can't see the red and they might not realize that. So we need to make sure that there's only the 30 doses. So to use an elliptor, it comes in a packet and it's only good for the 30 days. You zip the packet open, you then get it out and you only pull it back once. Now, if the phone went and I went to take it then and I close it up again, I would actually lose that dose forever. No people coming into the pharmacy say, this only lasted me for 10 days. You told me it was going to last a week. And it's because they've been fiddling with it, opening it up. It's like a wheel and it goes round. And so I've now got 27 doses left there. And I'll never see 27 again once I breathe in. Five seconds and hold it. Okay, so a great device. But look, we've now got one, two, three, four, five different devices. How likely is it that your patients get confused? So you've got to be very careful how you prescribe. How likely is it that they are using a something like a serotide together with a brio because they thought that they were different? And I see this frequently when I do home medicine reviews. The other thing to watch out for this one is that you need a decent inspiratory effort of about 50, 30 to 60 litres per minute. And that is shown by this. So if they can't make that sound, if they go, that device is not for them, which is why you've got to get your right devices for it. Now, the Spiromax is the one I told you I'd talk to you about. Here's your Spiromax that you might have seen. It comes in a big placebo. You can get that from the company. Now, it is not a metered dose inhaler. If you shake it, you're losing about 30% of the dose. So I check the dose inhaler on this one. It's now showing 36. I open the mouthpiece down until it makes a click. Click. Okay, I breathe away from the inhaler. I then inhale it like so. Hold it for five seconds. And down. Now, this one gives me a gritty little powder in my mouth, which I don't like, but fortunately it's a placebo. And this is why some people will prefer this to your actual um, turbuhaler because that one you can't taste anything. This one I can taste the lactose powder that was in there. Okay, so the turbuhaler, which has been around for a long time, this one do not shake. Again, check that you've got this one hasn't got the you can't see the placebo at the bottom there, but it's it's got a dose counter on it. So we turn it and we need to put it on a base. We turn it and we hear it go click. We breathe out away from the inhaler, we put it in, and we inhale. Hold it for five to 10 seconds. Okay, and then if you need another one, I always say wait a couple of minutes before you do your second breath because that enables penetration of the ingredients down into the smaller airways out to the bronchioles. And then you can get um, much more bronchodilatation because you've got that opened up the track down to the airways. The airways are like a tree, upside down tree, and you want to get right out to the end of the branches where the leaves and the flowers are, where you get your bronchioles, where you're going to get your oxygen exchange for the carbon dioxide that's been used. If you're lucky, you'd have one of these, but these have now been banned, and I shouldn't really be using this, but I'm going to, because people in the hat found there were particles in there, and dem people that were demonstrating this were inhaling the particles. But this just shows you, again, how much effort that you need. I used to use it in lectures when people were falling asleep, and it broke, also woke up the students. So you need quite a bit of effort to get that, actually, inhalation sufficient but if you can use it it's fine and even in emergency the studies that have shown that people can still use a turbuhaler I worry about it and some patients are not happy to use the turbuhaler in an emergency and would prefer to have a extra blue inhaler for emergency use or some of them might wish to have the repihaler which can be used in the spacer as well um, particularly my older people now the Respermat comes in its little device like so now, if it comes like this with the lid still up here, it means it hasn't been put together because we've got to put together the bottom part of it, um, which should be done by the pharmacist, although in many cases the older person can't actually 
um, put it together. So we need to get that one together. And you might look at this one and the person says, it's not working. So what you do is you twist it around. It won't twist. It won't twist. There's something wrong with it. The reason something wrong is because it has been all used up and the little counter has gone right up to the red. So if we look at a placebo here, you can see that the red part is around the bottle. So we twist it. You can twist it that way. Or for older people, I use a ringing action. So you twist it, you then flick up your this little part here, flick it up, and I'm not going to do this because I don't like inhaling this particular one, but you can see it, I hope, and out comes the powder. Okay, It should not be used in a spacer. There are some people wanting to use it in a spacer. I haven't got the evidence for this at this stage, but maybe in the, in the, in the future, but at this stage, the studies have not been done. It is a soft mist powder, and it goes out gently, but it is... The correct dose is once a day, two inhalations. But here's another trap for you, because here is the, um, they look very similar. And there is a, I think I have them both. That is the Spiato, and then you've also got the Spireva. So they look much, here it is, it's falling over on my tray. There's your Spireva, which is just your triatropium. There's your Spireva with your long-acting beta agonist as well. So we've got to make sure that people are using the right ones. And be very careful, particularly if your eyesight is not that good with it. So you've then, well, they haven't done any um, ones here with the Respa mat, with the handy hailer. This handy hailer you've been around for a long time. Out it goes, in goes the capsule, push it down, and like so, and breathe away, and in you come with that one. That's not on your sides. The other ones that are on your sides are these little ones here, which I've brought. You've got your Ultibro, your Ombres, and your Seabree. Seabree is a Llama, Ombres is a Lava, Ultibro is the combination. Guess what, how many times I've seen people doubling up with the wrong ones. So we need to make absolutely sure of what you're prescribing and which ones they're taking. The other thing to watch out with that one is it comes in the capsules and they are quite hard to get that capsule off to get it in. Once it goes in, it's beautiful to use and the little top comes off like so. It flicks to the back, in goes the capsule, down it goes and then you push it like so and then you have this lovely whirring noise which is really good in a nursing home situation because the staff are putting it in and you can hear the person if they've got low respiratory effort you can still hear them and you can see the capsule because it's a clear capsule and all the powder has gone from it so a useful device in copg and that's an added on extra for you okay the other added on extra that i want to do to make it complete is the brimica and the Vitaris. And that comes in this little device here, which is currently showing red. Off it comes, we push it down, it shows green, and we inhale it like so. Beautiful. But they've got to have that effort to be able to use it. So you can see you've got lots of devices to sort out which one suits the person, which is why it's really handy to have the full lot and see which ones people feel that they can use. So we're looking now at the deposition. Um, of the lungs using a spacer. And I am really, really pro spacers. Anyone using a, an inhaled corticosteroid um, with a uh, spacer is going to be much better off. They're getting much better inhalation. You get um, an increase from about 19 to 20% up to almost 30% of your deposition using a spacer. Certainly in an emergency, it's a lot better. We've got lots of different spacers now. You've got little spacers. You've got the one I showed you. And the old ones of the Volumatic are really have gone out. They're just too big, too cumbersome, and they're also plastic, so they require a lot of preparation prior to use. So with the use of your spacers, if you've got a non-static uh, spacer, you can use it straight away. If you've got a plastic one, then it has either got to be uh, washed and then air dried, or you spray about 30 puffs of a salbutamol inhaler to stop the particles adhering to the inside of the spacer. So the correct spacer care is to, open, I say about once a month, unless you've got an infection, it is one spacer, one person. Okay, open it up, put in warm soapy water with detergent, do not rinse it, and then let it air dry. 
and then you can use it again for the next 12 months. But they can be used straight away in an emergency. Um, re review and make sure that they're all working correctly. Nebulizers, nebulizers are really only for um, emergency use now. Certainly most um, GP surgeries are still like to have them. We're discouraging the use of them in aged care facilities because of the possible aerolization um, particles and also with high um, um, pressure oxygen as well, the same thing of the particles with it. They're getting a much higher dose. It's very cumbersome, it's very expensive, so it is only really used in emergencies. So I think we have actually got there and we've got, we haven't had any questions. I did see somebody putting up some hands for questions, but I wasn't sure how to get them, Catherine, so you might have to help me there. Yeah. So you've got lots um, and lots of resources and lots of things to find out and let's see how we go with our questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. That was really comprehensive and practical. Um, oh, there's a lot of stuff in it. <laughs> there certainly is. It's very, it was very comprehensive. Has anybody got any questions? We've got somebody flashing, but I can't see the question, unfortunately. I, that, I think that was Sonia, and I, she answered a I question. I can unmute her. Uh, Sonia, if I unmute you, yeah. um, feel free to ask your question. Okay, am I um, audible now, Jenny? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just sort of, when you were doing the demonstrations, a lot of it was under the screen, I couldn't see it. Oh, well, I can't see my own picture. Oh, no, yes, that's yes, bad. That's why I thought you might have, I mean, and I didn't no. know if it was just for you or everyone, because it's, yeah, no. sometimes I have issues. Um, mm. And I just wondered, we've got an ongoing argument at work with the nebulizer masks, um, whether they can be, washed and reused or whether single use, ditto with the tubing? Um, really, it is. I think you're very high risk at present with COVID-19, and I really mm. think you've got to think about single use with that. I've, uh, other presentations, I've got pictures of pseudomonas growing in those tubes. So you, it, unless you get them absolutely spot on, it, that's a problem. It's not as if you're going to be using them very frequently. It's a small price to pay for a patient to actually have a life-saving drug. So I would go for single use. Yeah, thank you. And is that is that sort of anywhere in writing that I can wave under Ishnaz? Um, I think you could find it um <laughs> infection guidelines. Everything is single use. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll thank try you. and hunt up something up for you. If you want to send me an email, I'll see if I can find something. Um yeah, it might true. even be in the um um COVID nineteen precautions on the NAC website. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So don't try and economise. Yeah, Sonia, you could look on the DHH. Yep, yeah, you could look on the DHHS web, website as well. Yeah. COVID. Don't try and economise. It's not it's worth. It. Just imagine, I do quite a little bit of litigation work, and I wouldn't endorse it. Yeah. I would. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm looking for support on what I'm saying, not to yeah. not to mm. use it. And I don't want to use COVID because otherwise the rationale will be, oh yeah, but COVID's gone now. It's all right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you've still got huge infection control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. I'm Thank so you, sorry. Sonia. I thought I was going to be able to see my screen and I thought if I hold it in the middle, are there any devices that anyone would like me to redo? No? Is there any more questions? Uh, oh, no, just one. I can't see myself on, on this one. Mm. There's, there's one from Amy uh, asking what are the implications of long-term Ventolin use? Long-term Ventolin use means that you possibly uh, endanger yourself to death and uh, there's, um, you are relying only on a bronchoconstriction, you're not treating the inflammation and uh, you'll find that um, the statistics are not good with that um, and if you're using more than three inhalers on a um, over a year more, um, without a, an inhaled corticosteroid, the rate of death of, from asthma goes up by 50%. So, yeah, uh, long term benefits and long term risks are very high. But people are, it wouldn't happen to me, I'm only using it a little bit, and they don't realize how much they're actually using. So, you, you've got your inflammation, you also get um, uh, airway remodeling, you get very um, brittle airways as well. You get a lot of fibre being formed down there, so you really need to have your inflammation being treated with it. 
Great. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Jenny. And thanks, Amy, for the question. Not good. It's, it, the hardest thing is to try and convince somebody because we get immediate relief with the salbutamol inhaler. Um, it's really tough to get them to pay uh, more because you can get your salbutamol inhaler over the counter for seven or eight dollars. And if you're going to get a and you're not a pensioner, you're going to be paying close to forty dollars for a Symbicort Rapihaler or Turbihaler. Once we get over that barrier and they're feeling so much better, um, they they don't mind paying. I remember when Ceratide first came in and people went on to that. And they'd come back for their repeats and say, I've never felt so well in my life. I really can. I can do my sport. I'm not getting wheezy all the time. And it was huge. And then I say, have you got a um, subutamol inhaler in case of emergency? So, oh, look, so long since I've used it. I better check and see if it's in date. So it really is a huge barrier to get over. And we're actually, the International Primary Health Network are running a series of uh, classes for pharmacists to try and edu help educate people about over-the-counter use of Ventolin. We're unlikely to change the legislation at this point in time. And it's, going, it's very, very hard to get people to recognize that there are better alternatives. I find that my actual diagram of using my hand actually works really well, saying, well, this is what the Ventolin's doing. It's acting on that muscle. But inside, there's all sorts of mucus and cells swelling up, and that's why, and that's where your inhaled corticosteroid acts. And that message seems to somehow get through. It, don't get too complicated. Don't say you're going to die from it because I say, yes, other people will die, but not me. If you try and explain the process, you might have luck. But it's a hard it's a challenge for us all. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everybody. And um, we're just over time. Dinner time yeah. now. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you very much, Jenny, um, for the presentation. You'll be receiving a evaluation um, via email. I'd be, we'd be very grateful if you could fill that in. And um, I hope to see you at our next event. One of our next events. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for all taking the time. It's a hard time at meal time. I really appreciate it because you now we can do something about asthma. We can make a difference. And it's so the other thing I should have said is don't forget it's hay fever time. Use your inhaled corticosteroids um, if you're using your a um, antihistamine all the time and make sure you've got an action plan for your patients that know what to do with thunderstorm asthma. 16th of November 2000 or 21st of November 2016 we had 10 deaths so make sure they know what to do in an emergency. The people who were using their combinations, their serotide, their symbicort didn't front up at ED, they didn't need to. It was the people who weren't thought we haven't got asthma, we're very mild, that did. And we ran out of Ventolin inhalers right throughout Melbourne. So thunderstorm asthma is a priority. There's a lot about it on the website as well. Sorry, I meant to mention that before, Catherine. A vital point. Right. Yeah, yep. from Melbourne particularly. Good really good point. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.